Powers, the copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Attention all Los Angeles County Sheriff's cars. Broadcast 144 regarding a murder in Men Canyon. All New Hall substation cars be on the lookout for suspicious persons in your district. That's all. Rose and Quest. America deserts its homes to live in trailers on the open road. Once again, the country echoes to the rumble of the covered wagon. And from one of these modern gypsies comes a letter addressed to calling all cars. Six months ago, I gave up the idea of getting a new car, bought a trailer instead, and gave up my home to live on wheels. Every day I'm on the road, a different town nearly every night. There was only one objection to my idyllic new life. My old car lacked the power to pull the heavy trailer when we came to hills. And the slightest grade reduced me to whirring along in second gear. I've tried every gasoline sold in the West. None made any difference until I tried Rio Grande Crack. I don't understand this patented cracking process you advertise, but I'll gladly testify that Rio Grande Crack gasoline has actually increased the power of my car. It hardly seems possible, but my trailer and I hit the hills on high now. Rio Grande Crack Gasoline has made all the difference in the world. That letter is from Carl Hale Dixon, trailer tourist whose temporary address is 1000 North Curzon Avenue, Los Angeles. His enthusiastic letter proves again from a new angle that Rio Grande Crack Gasoline must be the most powerful, the fastest, the quickest starting gasoline on this market. Else, why should it be specified more than any other brand to power the hundreds of police cars, fire engines, and emergency equipment in the largest cities and counties of the West? When are you going to discover what a difference Rio Grande Cracked makes in the performance of your car? And now it is our pleasure to present Sheriff Eugene Biscalouz of Los Angeles County. Sheriff Biscalouz. Good evening, friends. It is a strange thing how the legend of buried treasure persists. Thousands of dollars have been spent by fortune-hunting expeditions to discover the hidden hordes of the pirates, Captain Kidd, and Jean Lafitte. Yet there has never been any conclusive indication that those worthy buccaneers ever buried any treasure. Closer to home, we often encounter a similar circumstance with more ghastly results. Some gossip will start an idle tale that this or that person has buried his money under his house or keeps it in a jar on the pantry shelf. The rumor becomes a fact to the busybodies who embroider it with every telling. The amount of hidden wealth increases with each recountal. It becomes solid gold instead of currency. Imagination weaves ridiculous fantasy around the private life of some poor recluse who asks nothing but to be left alone. Sooner or later, the story is told in a scrupulous person, and we have another attack, or as is often the case, a murder on our hands. And in almost every instance, the criminal finds no gold. There's a very good reason for this. Even the most eccentric miser these days realizes that a bank is the safest place to keep money. You citizens could do a vastly important service and perhaps save a life if you scoff at any, refuse to believe, or repeat the next story about buried wealth that comes to your ears. It is Sunday evening, May 18th, 1930. In a little ranch house in Mint Canyon, 70-year-old Albert Horton and his half-deaf nonagenarian brother, George, are reading the Sunday papers by the light of an oil lamp. Well, George, according to the papers, Hoover says prosperity is just around the corner. Eh? Just around the corner. Oh, he's been saying that for six months now. There ain't been no change. Price of alfalfa still going down, and the price of food still going up. Yep, but don't know what it'll all come to. Well, what this country needs is William Jennings Bryan. If he'd only won the election back in '96, we wouldn't be in this mess now. Now, George, no very well by metalism wouldn't work. It just ain't good government. Oh, well, that's the trouble with you, Albert. For a young fella, you're the most set in your ways I ever did see. Well, for a fella that'll be 90 next year, you talk like one of these here radicals. Now, I never could understand. 
Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What is it now? Well, it sounds like the horse is around. Well, what's in town? Well, I'll go see. I'll go see. Uh, where'd I put my pistol? Uh, uh, pistol all over there on the mantel. Uh, somebody's been thrown around that crowd. I'm trying to find the mantel. who I am. Just get over there and sit down on that bed and you won't get hurt. Oh, what's, what, what's the matter? What's happened out there? Oh, just a little argument. Don't let it worry you, none. Well, you, you, you got Albert's pistol there. Yeah, and one of my own. And if you start any funny business, I'll empty them both into you. Why, we used to string rascals like you up to the nearest tree when I was a young man. <laughs> yeah, but times have changed, Pop. Well, what are you, you going to do with me? Nothing. I'm just keeping you quiet until my pals get through. Well, what are they after? You ought to know. They're going to relieve you of that gold you got hidden out here. Go Gold? We haven't got any gold here. Yeah? Well, maybe you've forgotten about it, but we know different. I wonder what's keeping those guys. Should have answered. Now, listen, Pop. I'm going out to see where those guys are, and don't you move out of this house, because I'll be covering the door. <laughs> Young whippersnapper. They're giving me orders. Wait till I get my shotgun. I'll show them I'm just as good a shot as I ever was. Tell you, get away with it. No, sir. I can't get... What's this? Albert. Albert, speak to me. Albert, it's your brother George. Oh, speak to me, for God's sake. L.A. Sheriff's Office, Hutchinson speaking. Uh, this is James Catlaw speaking. There's been a murder up here. Where? Up at the Horton's Ranch, 15 miles up Mint Canyon from Saugus. Old George Horton just walked down to my place and says his brother's been shot. Okay, tell him to keep his shirt on. We'll be right up. <laughs> Deputy Sheriff Hutchinson immediately phones Captain Bright. Chief of the Sheriff's Homicide Department at his home, who instructs him to have the substation at Newhall confirm the murder report and then notify him. In less than ten minutes, the answer comes in from Newhall, affirming the first call, and Captain Bright starts in his own car for the Horton Ranch. Arriving there in record time, he attempts to interview the badly frightened George Horton, but finding that he can get no more than vague answers to his questions, he leaves the old man and continues his investigation by himself. And by the time Hutchinson arrives with camera equipment, he has found... One brass 32 shell casing. Two sets of footprints leading to and from the porch. Tire tracks in the soft dirt of the road. With these facts in his possession, Captain Bright supervises the taking of pictures. Mentally notes the position of the body. Then assigns deputies William Penn Pray's and Virgil Gray, who have arrived on the scene, to take over the investigation. They begin by questioning James Catlaw, who first reported the murder. Well, it's just like I told the officers over the phone. Old Mr. Horton came down to the house a half scared out of his wits and said his brother had been murdered. Then I called the sheriff's office and started back up the road toward the house with Mr. Horton. And the only people we saw was Mr. and Mrs. Heinrich coming down the road. Yeah, my name's Heinrich. I live about a hundred yards from Horton's place. I've palmed some of his land on a share basis. But we weren't home when the shooting occurred. We were down to Newhall to the movie. Did Horton have any enemies? Well, there was some bad blood between him and Dayton Furnival. He was the fellow that sold the ranch to the Hortons, and they was having some argument over the details of the transaction. Anybody else around here that might be called enemies of the Hortons? No, not so you could say no. Did he have any close friends around here? Well, there's George McCoy and his wife. They live up the canyon a piece. Well, I'll be blessed if I don't think Furnival bore any ill will. Can you think of any reason, Mr. McCoy, why Mr. Horton should have been so brutally attacked? Well, of course, there was plenty of folks around here that thought the Hortons had gold buried on their ranch. What's that? Yeah, you see, they come down here from Tulare County where they had a big ranch, and, well, it was legend up in those parts that the Hortons buried a lot of money on the place. Of course, nobody would have known about it if it hadn't been for that Mexican. What Mexican? The Mexican kid that worked for them up in Tulare and came down here with them. Oh, he told folks around here all about the gold. What was that Mexican's name? Uh, Tony Martinez, I think it was. Oh, he don't work for them any longer, though. He got a job at the Bulldog Brake Lining plant out in Watts. What do you know about Dayton Furnival? Well, he and his brothers-in-law, a couple of fellows by the name of Brothers, they traded ranches. They took the Hortons' place in Tulare County, and the Hortons took their place down here. 
Oh, it's kind of a mixed-up deal. I never could understand it. Furnival still lives around here, doesn't he? Yeah, he's he's still got a place here. Oh, great. I'll go talk to Furnival, and you look at Horton's place. Look it over and see if there's any indication of hidden gold. Okay, I'll meet you back there. So you can see, Mr. Furnival, any light you can throw on this case will be of great help to us. I'll be glad to be of any assistance I can. First of all, what do you know about this buried gold legend about the Hortons? I've heard the stories. And when my brothers-in-law took over the place up in Tulare County, they heard it up there. But I don't place much faith in it. I happen to know that the Hortons have over $200,000 safely deposited in various Los Angeles banks. I understand there was bad blood between you and the Hortons. Nonsense. If there was any bad blood, it was on Albert's part. He felt that we hadn't lived up to the terms of the agreement we made when we traded ranches. But I didn't dislike him. It was a nice old fella. I didn't have it in for him, if that's what you mean. Ask Walter Hewitt. He can tell you that. Who's he? Well, he's related to be my marriage, and he's also a nephew of the Horton. When can I get in touch with him? I imagine he'll be out here today. I phoned him when I heard what had happened, and he said he'd come out. Well, when he gets here, I want to talk to him. Well, Gray, have you found any buried treasure? Not much. I found two canvas sacks full of $20 gold pieces and an old trunk. $280 in all. You could hardly call that treasure. No sign of a search being made for it. No. There hasn't been anything disturbed in the house. It's very puzzling. This man, Furnival, seems to be on the level. He tells me the Horton brothers have a couple of hundred grand in the bank. I don't get it at all. They bump off the old man and never even try to look for the money. I beg your pardon, Sheriff. Uh, here's Mr. Hewitt. You said you wanted to see him when he got here. Oh, yes. I've been wanting to talk to you, Mr. Hewitt. Well, I want to talk to you. Who did it? That's what I want to know. Who killed my uncle? Well, that's what we all want to know, Mr. Hewitt. That's what we're here for. Have you got any ideas? None whatsoever. What about this feud with Mr. Furnival? Oh, that was some argument about the roads on this place. Nothing serious. Well, just what are the details of that deal? Well, my uncles were getting old, and I wanted them to be near me in Los Angeles. So I arranged a deal whereby my uncles took this ranch in exchange for their ranch in Tulare County, plus a $25,000 mortgage on the place. My uncles had threatened to foreclose the mortgage on Furnival and his brothers-in-law because they were having a disagreement about the road. A uh, sufficient motive for murder, Mr. Hewitt? Ridiculous. The disagreement wasn't that serious. The officers, working slowly and meticulously week after week, are unable to discover any evidence to strengthen the tenuous theory that the involved land deal might have been the reason for the murder. However, their developments cause actual accusations to be made from another source. When, after George Horton, weakened by the shock of his brother's death, follows him to eternity. Walter Hewitt and his sister are named the sole beneficiaries of the Horton's fortune. Disgruntled heirs, cut off without a penny, actually charge a conspiracy to murder. But before this nasty mess has progressed to an embarrassing degree, a new twist enters the case when on a day in early September, Deputy Sheriff Gray receives a tele telephone call. Huh? Let me speak to Gray. This is him speaking. Listen, Van Virgil, this is Kaltoff down in Long Beach. Yeah? Listen, I just fell across something that looks like a lead on that Mint Canyon murder. Yeah, what is it? We certainly need a lead on that job. We've been working on it for three months, and we haven't got, gotten any further than the mudslinging of the heirs to the Horton estate. Well, you come down here and talk to Mrs. Eva Stone at, at 2020 Atlantic Avenue. She's got a story that you'll be interested in. Well, gentlemen... It isn't a very, very nice thing to discuss. It makes me very unhappy, but I think it's for the best. I'm sure it is, Mrs. Stone, and now suppose you discuss it. Very well. I suppose I'd better begin at the beginning. That's the customary way. Well, you see, I have two daughters, one 16 and the other 14. And you gentlemen can't know what a task it is for a widow woman to bring up two growing girls nowadays. Undoubtedly. But what have your daughters to do with that murder? I'm coming to that. My oldest daughter, Ella, recently fell for a no-good oil driller by the name of Lloyd Dye. I tried to break up the thing, and I tried to reason with Ella. But you know how girls are now nowadays, or do you? Yes, Mrs. Stone, I do. Well, I looked up this young man, and I found that he'd been sent to the I Own Reform School some time ago on some sort of a dirty charge. Well, I, I just don't let myself think about, about such things. But who knows, with such a person, whether my daughter might be next. Well, he wouldn't let her alone, so I decided to get the goods on him and get him out of town for good. And did you? Did I? Wait, wait till you hear. I checked up on him and found that at the time he was making love to my daughter, he was talking on dark roads with young Mildred Root, who lives over on Dalboa Street. I did a little, little detective work myself, and I found that he had confessed to Mildred that he had killed that old rancher up in Mint Canyon last May. Are you sure about that? Positive. You don't have to take my word for it. Go ask Mildred. That's just what we're going to do. Yes? 
Miss Ruth? Yes? We'd like to talk to you for a few moments. Well, what about? We're from the sheriff's office. Oh. May we come in? Well, well, I don't know. My mother isn't here right now. And... We want to talk to you, not your mother. And we've got to talk to you right away. Oh, well, very well. I suppose you can come in. Yeah, thank you. May I introduce myself? I am Deputy Penpross. And this, this is Deputy Gray. How do you do? Uh, well, won't you sit down? Thank you. Well, what is it you wanted to talk to me about? Well, we'll come to the point, Mr. Do you know Lloyd Dye? Well, no. I don't think... Well, that is... We know that you do. All right. Yes, I know him. And he confessed to you that he killed that rancher up in Mint Canyon last May. No. No, I don't know anything about oh, that. Oh, come now, Miss Root. Please, the truth. Oh, I don't want to get in trouble. I'm a good girl. I don't want to get in a jam. You won't get in any jam, Miss Root, but you've got to help us. Yes, tell us about it, Miss Root. Well, he... He came down here on May 19th. That'd be the day after the murder, Penn. Yes, go ahead, Miss Root. Well, there... There isn't anything much to tell. He said he was shot, and he was afraid that he was going to die. And then he told me that he killed the old man, and that he disposed of all the evidence, and the police would never get him. Why didn't you report this to the police, Miss Root? Oh, well, I thought he was bluffing. I thought he was trying to impress me. Where does Di live? Well, do... Do I have to tell you that? You'll save us time if you do. We'll find out anyway. Well, he... He lives in a hotel over on Pacific Avenue. At number 263. Yes, gentlemen, what can I do for you? We're looking for a Lloyd Dye. He live here? Dye? Yes, yes, he's got a room here. Is he in now? No, he isn't. When do you expect him? Oh, he usually comes in around 5 o'clock. What number's his room? 110. Let's have the key. Well, I, I can't do that. We're from the sheriff's office, buddy. Hand over the key and don't tip him off when he comes in. First thing to do is to see if we can find that gun. Right. You look through that bureau and I'll see what's in this clothes button. Never mind, Gray. Here it is. Oh, let's see. Look, 32. I'll bet a dollar this is the gun that killed Albert Horton. What a break, boy. Quiet. Somebody's coming down the hall. Here's our boy. All right, Dye. Up with your hands. Say, what is it? You're under arrest for murder. For murder? You're crazy. No, you're crazy. To think that you could get away with that job out in Mint Canyon last spring. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Stick out your arm. Say, listen, you. I'll get you guys for false arrest. Well, yeah, that's your privilege. If we made a mistake, for the time being, you'll be smart. You'll just quietly answer our question. What was the idea of killing that old rancher? I, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, who was in that deal with you? You own a car, Dye? I used to. What happened to it? Uh, the finance company. What finance company? I don't know. Yeah, we'll find out through the Motor Vehicle Bureau. Oh, go ahead and find out, but I don't know what company. Want to tell us the truth, Di? I am telling you the truth. All right, my friend, have it your way. It's all the same to us whether you talk or not. You're going to jail anyway. While the ballistics expert checks the 32 caliber gun found in Dye's room, Penn Praise tracks down the car Di formerly owned, finds it, compares its tires with the photograph of the tire prints at the scene of the crime, returns to headquarters. Well, Gray, the tire on Di's car checked with our pictures. Good. Three of them are still on the wheels, the fourth is on the spare. And the gun we found in his room is the same one that shot Albert Horton. Furthermore, I had the doctor examine him. He's got a scar from a bullet wound in the abdomen. I questioned him about it, and he claims he was shot by some dame's husband down in Long Beach as he was crawling out the bedroom window. Hmm. Modest lad, isn't he? Yeah, he'll talk about anything but the Horton mess. Absolutely denies it. But he thinks he's big stuff for the women, eh? I should say he does. Then he's done a lot of boasting to them. I don't follow you. He shot off his face to Mildred Root. He's told her more than she'll admit. So if we can't make him talk, we'll make her talk, is that it? Exactly. Come on. Now, listen, Miss Root, you've got to help. Oh, why can't you let me alone? You've got him in jail. What else do you want? We want to know everything he told you. It's bad enough that I had him put in jail. What will he think of me? We told you we'd keep you out of this. He doesn't even suspect that you put the finger on him. We're protecting you. Why can't you play ball with us? Oh, all right. What else do you want? Who was with him out at the Horton Ranch? Well, he told me that he went out there with Gordon Gauss and and some Mexican fellow. Gordon Gauss. How do you spell that? G-A-U-S-S? I guess so. What was the Mexican's name? I don't know. Sure you don't know? I'm telling you the truth. I don't know his name. All right, now, don't get excited, Miss Root. Just go ahead with your story. Well, that's about all I know. Lloyd told me that they went out there because they'd heard that the Hortons kept a lot of gold hidden out there. Where's this Gauss live? I don't know. Does he drive a car? Yes, I think so. What kind? Well, last I heard, he he had a yellow Ford. (laughs) 
Calling all cars. Attention all cars. Attention all Los Angeles County Sheriff's cars. All Long Beach cars. Be on the lookout for a yellow Ford Roadster. License number 7 Victor 348. 7 Victor 348. Arrest the occupant of this car and notify Long Beach Sheriff's substation. That's all. Hello, everybody. <laughs> What's your hurry? You look like you're going on a trip all that baggage back there. Well, yeah. Yeah, I'm going down to the Imperial Valley. You were going to the Imperial Valley. What's the charge? I was only driving 25 and I stopped back there for that light. I don't know anything, buddy. I got orders to pick you up. That's all I know. For further information, you'll have to ask the sheriff's office. I, I don't know what you're talking about, I tell you. It didn't have nothing to do with no murder. Well, I've never even been to Mint Canyon. No use, Gus. We knew you were there. You drove up to Horton's ranch with Lloyd Dye and a Mexican fellow in Dye's Pontiac sedan. One of you shot and killed Horton. Probably it was Dye. The other, probably you, held up the other Horton brother, the old man, for several minutes. Now let's have a straight up. I tell you, I'm innocent. Where were you the night of May 18th? Well, oh, should I know? No thing now. It was a Sunday night. Well, if it was a Sunday night, I was in bed by 10 o'clock. How come you're so sure about that, huh? Well, because I had to be up at 6 in the morning to get to work. Where do you work? Out at the Bulldog Brake Line implant and what? Who was that Mexican that was with you that night? I don't know no Mexican. I've never known no Mexican. Hey, wait a minute, Gray. I know who that Mexican is now. Who? Tony Martinez, the boy who used to work for the Hortons. How do you know? You remember? When we were questioning the relatives of Horton, they said that Martinez had quit to go to work for the Bulldog Brake Line implant and what? Sure, that's the bird. How about it, Gauss? Was the Mexican Tony Martinez? I never knew no Mexican. <laughs> Inquiry at the Bulldog Brake Lining Plant reveals the fact that Martinez left his job the day after Dye's arrest. The Border Patrol is notified, but fails to produce the missing Martinez. The two deputies center their questioning on Gauss, the weaker of their two prisoners. Day follows day of grueling questioning. And then, finally... All right. All right, I'll, I'll come clean. I don't see what you got on me anyway. I didn't shoot the old man. You can't pin murder on me. We, we went up there all right, all three of us. Di, Martinez, and me. And what happened? Well, let me tell this my own way, and it'll be the truth, every bit of it. Okay, start talking. I met Martinez a year ago over at the Bulldog plant. As soon as we got to know each other, he told me about the ranch where he used to work and how the old men that owned it kept a flock of gold money hidden out there. He wanted me to help him rob him. I put him off for months. I've never been mixed up in no beefs, and I didn't like the idea. Finally persuaded me to go up there and look the place over. I did. And a little while later, I introduced Martinez to Di, and Martinez suggested we cut Di in on the deal. We told him about it, and he liked the idea. And that Sunday in May, I run into him in Long Beach, and he suggested we pull the job that night. I was scared, but he insisted. So we picked up Martinez over in Downey and drove out to the canyon. When we got there, it was late in the evening, and Martinez let the horses out so as the old men would come out of the house. We were going to hold him outside the house while Martinez went through the place to find the gold. We didn't plan no murder, but only one of them come out and die jumped him while I run inside and held the other one up. I didn't hear nothing from outside, so I went out and die and Martinez had scrammed. I had to hitchhike back to Long Beach. The whole thing was a mess, and I didn't have nothing to do with the shooting. When this confession is typed out, will you sign it? Yeah, yeah, This yeah. confession has been given without any force or intimidation been being used on you? None. None that I know of. <laughs> Armed with Gauss's signed confession, the officers interview Di, who, after carefully reading the document, comes clean. Ah, uh, we didn't mean to bump off nobody. I was wrestling with the old guy on the porch, and he pulled out his gat and shot me in the middle. Well, I started to run. He fired a second shot at me, so I turned around and I let him have it. It is the opinion of this court that insufficient evidence of guilt has been presented in your case, Gordon Gauss. <laughs> And therefore, you are acquitted of the charge of murder. However, there is no question of a doubt that you, Lloyd Dye, are indeed guilty of second-degree murder, and the court hereby sentences you to serve a term of from seven years to life in the state penitentiary. But Dye's attorney appeals his case to the Supreme Court, which grants him a new trial. And the result of that trial is one of the strangest ironies in California legal history. The day at last arrives when the judge delivers his verdict. In the opinion of this court, there can be no question of the guilt of the defendant, Lloyd Dye, of the crime of murder. 
In this case, a useless, brutal murder of an old man. This court cannot see the justification of leniency shown in the defendant's previous trial and cannot be swayed in the interest of the defendant in consideration of his voluntary confession. In the opinion of this court, only one verdict is possible, and this is guilty of murder in the first degree. And the court hereby sentences the defendant to post and penitentiary for the rest of his natural life. Had Dye been satisfied with the first court's verdict, he would have been freed under the parole system in a few years. But as it is, he must live and die in Folsom Penitentiary. Our men kept constantly after the missing member of the murder trio, Tony Martinez, and having located him in Mexico, tried to lure him across the line at Calexico. But he was too wily and escaped the Mexican police waiting there for him. However, it's only a matter of time until he, too, is brought to trial for his participation in the plot to rob the Horton brothers. Thank you, Sheriff. Remember when you were a youngster how you wanted to be a policeman? Or perhaps you wanted to be a detective and solve crimes? Rio Grande has made it possible for thousands of boys and girls to achieve this ambition. These youngsters belong to Rio Grande's junior police department. All wear a metal police badge. Nearly all have handcuffs, microscopes, fingerprint outfits or some of the other 14 articles in Rio Grande's junior detective outfit. And they got these valuable gifts through the generosity of motorists like yourself who use Rio Grande cracked gasoline. You can outfit your own children or some neighborhood youngster with a 14-piece detective outfit at absolutely no cost to yourself. Just drive into any Rio Grande cracked gasoline station and ask. Get a free copy of the Calling All Cars News and read all about it. You've got to buy some motor oil this week. And if you seriously want the best oil for your car... You'll ask your Rio Grande dealer about Sinclair motor oil. He'll tell you how the special Sinclair de-waxing and de-jellying process ensures that you get an absolutely pure oil free from all waste, guaranteed against breaking down under engine strain. Rio Grande dealers recommend Sinclair motor oil according to your own car manufacturer's specification to all users of Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Your engine feels so much peppier with cracked gasoline that you can't resist speeding up. Cracked gasoline starts your engine so quickly that ordinary oils often fail to lubricate those first few seconds. Rio Grande dealers guarantee Sinclair motor oils to give never-failing lubrication in any emergency. 